All right. Welcome back, folks. All you investors and traders around the world. Welcome back to our Phenom Group members. And I am out. Folks, I'm heading on vacation starting tomorrow, December 1st. But my question to you is, are you ready for 2024? We've got one month to go here before 2024 is ushered in and investors you know, what kind of landscape are we looking at in 2024? Now, we've already heard from many of the Wall Street institutions, whether it's Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs. What do you think is going to happen? Drop me a comment in the comment section of this video so I can hear back from you and maybe give you my outlook. With that being said, thank you for uh, all your support throughout the course of this year. I uh, hope everybody is achieving the goals that they had laid out for themselves uh, within the calendar year. Uh, and many well wishes to you in 2024. So what might 2024 look like? You're going to spend the next half hour with me and we'll find out. 25, 30 minutes, we should be able to get it done. All right. Now, with this video, I want to emphasize something, right? I, I often say to people, look, you know what you know. <laughs> you don't know what you don't know. Context is key. Reading comprehension skills are critical to an investor. Context and comprehension are key. Now, look at this, folks. Look at what I say here, right? I know now some of you and ladies, please, I am not trying to offend. But a woman without her man is nothing. I'm sorry. That's what the sentence says. Or does it? Remember, context is key. I'm going to drop my screen share here for a second and be right back with something you might find interesting. Right. One second. Some of you may already know this, may have seen it elsewhere. <laughs> and we are back. Okay. Now let's see what happens. Remember, a man, a woman without her man is nothing. Context is key. Now let's look at the same words but with different punctuation. A woman, without her, man is nothing. Now tell me, you've probably read hundreds, maybe thousands of transcripts, looked at hundreds, thousands of charts, and thought to yourself, you know what you're doing, right? Folks, this is an exercise in perspective and reading comprehension. You know, it's hard. It's hard to fully understand and grasp what a CEO is explaining to an investor and to analysts on a conference call. Thousands and thousands of charts interpreted by thousands and thousands of investors. Be open-minded and flexible to recognizing that you may not have the full grasp of everything you're reading, seeing, and hearing in the financial media, let alone in quarterly conference calls from CEOs and CFOs. Be flexible, humble yourselves as investors before the market. And we've got some more exercises in context and reading comprehension ahead. If this is not the kind of thing you want to hear. Trust me, you're wrong. <laughs> All right, with that being said, a couple of weeks ago in our Phenom Group Weekend Research Report, I laid out that I believe the Fed has everything that they need to cut rates in the first quarter of 2024. Again, you know, what's the outlook for 2024? Are you ready for 2024? Now, me saying this two weeks ago, nobody found favorable. Nobody, are you kidding me, Seth? The rate cuts, when you look at the Fed fund futures, have the earliest cut for June. That's the second quarter of 2024. You're saying the first quarter? No, I'm not saying that. I'm reading. I'm just regurgitating 
what Jerome Powell told us at the July 2023 FOMC press conference when he was answering a question from Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, Jeff Cox asked the chairman a question about more rate hikes or what's the possibility, what is the framework criterion for a rate cut? And here was Chairman Powell's retort or response to Jeff Cox of CNBC. So if we see inflation coming down credibly, sustainably, then we don't need to be at a restrictive level anymore. That's it. That's it, folks. You can stop reading now. But, you know, for context, you do want to keep reading. We can, you know, we can move back to a to a neutral level and then below a neutral level at a certain point. I think we would, you know, we would, we, of course, would be very careful about that. We'd really want to be sure that inflation is coming down in a, uh, in a sustainable level. And it's hard to make. I'm not going to try to make a numerical assessment of when and where that will be. But that's the way I would think about it, is you'd start, you'd stop raising rates long before you got to 2% inflation. And you'd start cutting before you got to 2% inflation. And that's your criterion, folks. So let's think about the monthly CPI, PPI, and today's PCE data. Is inflation coming down credibly? Right? We've, had, we've got a year, more than a year's worth of disinflationary CPI, PPI, and PCE readings. I think that's credible. Is it sustainable? Well, that's a year already. And by all accounts, it seems very sustainable. The trend of disinflation has been cemented throughout the course of this year. So here's the thing, and what Jerome Powell wants people to understand as well. This is the context part of it. For every notch down for every tenth, two tenths, three tenths of a percent down in the PCE. If the Fed holds rates just where they are, doesn't raise them, but just holds them where they are, they are passively restricting economic activity. They are tighter if they stay at those elevated levels. Passive tightening, it's called. So Jerome Powell is giving you the framework. This was from the July FOMC press conference. This is the transcript. I think a lot of institutions overlooked it. We didn't hear at Phenom Group. We gave, you know, this was part of our weekend research report two weeks ago, November 19th. And as usual, if you don't subscribe and you don't receive our weekend research report, our state of the market videos, our notes over the weekend. Well, was last week, last weekend on the 25th, I sent out overbought conditions in the S&P 500. And you get my context to it. What would Seth do with these overbought conditions? Well, here's what I would do. Here's how I'm thinking about it. NASDAQ is less overbought than the S&P 500. You get all this detail. You get our research reports. You get what you're seeing now after the fact in this video. So go subscribe. Treat yourself for the holidays, folks. $14.99. You get all of this data. You get all of our analytics each week. All right, now let's move on. Well, Seth says he believes that the Fed's going to cut in the first quarter. All of a sudden, two days ago, Bill Ackman bets Fed will cut interest rates as soon as the first quarter. Ackman said he has observed evidence of a weakening, weakening economy. So his premise for believing the Fed needs to cut is because the economy is weakening possibly faster than the Fed understands. Is that really what Bill Ackman thinks? Or is everything that I outlined here just not newsworthy? right? The Fed needs to cut because if inflation keeps coming down, they're passively restricting the economy and they don't need to be at a restrictive level per Jerome Powell. There's nothing sexy about that, right? 
there is something sexy about the economy weakening faster than maybe the Fed believes, and it comes from Bill Ackman. There's an element of fear built into that. I don't think Bill Ackman thinks the economy is weakening faster than the Fed believes. I think he knows how to grab headlines. He knows how to work with the media. Nonetheless, you have a big money manager jumping on the Seth Golden uh, you know, bandwagon, so to speak. All right. So got the Fed out of the way, right? Again, what might we see in 2024? In my opinion, we're going to see some rate cuts. I, I won't go so far as to say how many I think the Fed will have. We'll outline that with supporting evidence in our weekend research reports to Phenom Group members and talk about it in our trading room uh, on a daily basis. With that, we'll move on to our next subject matter. The Leading Economic Index, otherwise known as the LEI, the acronym for the Leading Economic Index, right? Bad, 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 right? For 19 straight months, 19 consecutive months, the LEI has been trending lower. 19 months, folks, almost two years. Gina Martin Adams of Bloomberg, is this just a job full recession? Meaning we're still growing jobs, but everything else looks like crap. Based on the LEI, the Leading Economic Index, the LEI fell below 1% year over year in August 2022. This has never happened without the economy being declared in a recession already. Likewise, the index is down 7.6% year over year, a drop never before recorded outside of a recession. I mean, you were already in a recession if you were down 7.6% in the LEI on a year over year basis. How come we're not in a recession this time? Remember, you only know what you know. Liz Ann Saunders, same crap, pretty much the same chart. LEI is for crap. Leading economic index from the conference board, they're the ones that developed the LEI, fell by 0.8 month over month in October, keeping year over year rate deeply negative at negative 7.6 and in recession territory. What's going on here? How is the LEI so bad? But the National Bureau of Economic Research hasn't labeled a recession yet. They're the ones that are tasked with um, uh, you know, labeling an official recession. All right, so let's get into the details here of what the LEI is and what's going on here. The Leading Economic Index was created as a compilation of economic metrics that when combined into a single index has the ability to foreshadow or herald a turning point in the economy and otherwise signal a recession was in the offing or already happening. There is a widely misunderstood aspect to the conference board's leading economic index. However, most are not aware. Most of the reporting journalists and strategists, she's a journalist, she's a strategist with Charles Schwab, if you're not familiar with Liz Ann Saunders, most of the reporting journalists, strategists, economists, financial media have no knowledge of the fact that the LEI has been reformulated over the last 50 years on several occasions. These are the different components. Look at them closely, folks. The financial components are the leading credit index, the S&P 500 stock price itself, interest rate spread, the 10-year T-bond less the Fed funds rate. Now you have your non-financial components. Consumer expectations, ISM new orders, building permits, average weekly hours in manufacturing. Manufacturers, you're getting a sense of how much manufacturing crap is in this. Manufacturing new orders, non-defense capital goods, manufacturers new orders, consumer goods and materials, and average weekly initial jobless claims, unemployment insurance. It's a lot of manufacturing crap, right? What makes that so funny is manufacturing is basically 15% of the U.S. economic output or GDP. 70% of our economy is consumption and services. Services. Do you see services in here, folks? Which component in here is services? Well, the leading credit index, you could make an argument, is a, it's a level of the financial services industry, if you will right? Credit, lending, so on and so forth. So we have one component. The rest is largely jobs, 
and manufacturing. Jobs, wages, manufacturing. And this is supposed to tell us the turning points in the economy. You see the error and why? Let's not lose this, lose sight of this. Um, so there was a there was one, and you're not most of the reporters in the knowledge of the fact that the LEI has been reformulated over the last 50 years on several occasions. Um, now the construct is from the conference board. The LEI is a composite index of several indicators, 10. It is a predictive, it is, <laughs> it is a predictive variable that anticipates or leads turning points in the business cycle and anticipates where the economy is heading. Since the LEI is comprised of multiple components, it is meant to provide a clearer picture as it is able to smooth out volatility associated with individual components. The 10 components are all right here as we just went over. This is what the LEI looks like right now, folks. Peaked here. Late 2021, and it's just been down, down, down. I mean, it is nasty. 19 months down, lower, lower, lower. So what's going on here? Keep in mind what I said earlier. Conference boards, LEI, down 19 months in a row. But it's been reformulated four times since the 1980s. See, this is supposed to predict recessions. Then why does it need to be reformulated? If all of these components were right in predicting the turning point in the, in the economy, remember, leading, leading, it's supposed to foreshadow. You know, this is why investors, strategists, economists, they, they want this kind of a leading indicator to keep them from the pitfalls in the stock market. And why does it need to be reformulated if it does such a good job of that? Here's what most people don't understand. This reformulation happened in the 80s. It happened in the 90s. And the most recent reformulation of the LEI happened in 2011 after the great financial crisis. Remember, this is basically our only services services light <laughs> um, component of the LEI, the Leading Credit Index. If you go to the conference board's website, here it is, December 20th, 2011. They updated and reformulated the LEI to include the Leading Credit Index. You know what they also did? They recalculated the data from the past years to include the, the leading credit index. And when you do that, it looks like in 2007 into 2008, the LEI actually foresaw the great financial, well, not the great financial crisis, but the 2008 recession. Kind of sucks, doesn't it, right? They recalculated so it looks like it. So when people are all how well, you know, it's just an it's an inevitability we're going to go into a recession. The LEI can't be this wrong forever. Really? Or was the LEI never really right and never really did the job it was supposed to? It was reformulated in the 80s. It was reformulated in the 90s. You don't have to reformulate something if it's working as intended. And you certainly don't have to go back to the data after you reformulate again recalculate that data to show it was effective. When in real time, 2007, 2008, it was not. But most people don't know this. You only know what you know, right? I mean, we see the data come in on it. How many, you know, fresh out of college, out of journalism school, they get a job at Bloomberg, they get a job at Yahoo Finance or on CNBC or on Fox Business News. How many of them do you think went back to the, to the conference board's website, found this nuanced article, and you can download, by the way, you can download the whole report. You can see what it says for yourself. You can look at all the charts, the recalculations, the reformulations. How many people do you think coming out of college did this? But now, right? Right? They're disseminating this data. They're writing articles about it. They're formulating their recession models 
around the LEI's utility in perfect track record that may have never been because they don't know about these reformulations. Again, to my point, you only know what you know. And for those that you know keep beating the drum of a recession, look at the LEI, you keep looking at it. Labor market seems fine. Service sector, sector is doing great. Rail traffic is doing great. Trucking tonnage is doing great. Consumer spending is doing great. Retail trade is doing great. Personal income, rising wages. Don't you wish a lot, of, a lot more of that was in here? Don't you think that's more credible? Folks, we just went through a pandemic. You're really using old models for something that has never happened in history to predict a future recession. Stop predicting in the first place. Get away from that exercise altogether. Again, context. You only know what you know. We only know so much. Did I know? To, I decided. I did. I said to myself, there's... I'm forecasting for next year for Phenom Group members. I'm forecasting for the Golden Capital Portfolio. I need to have an outlook. What do I think is going to happen in the economy going forward? I'm not going to lie to you. I look at this every month it comes out. And even to myself, I've always known this is a problem. There's too much manufacturing data in here, too many manufacturing metrics, when we have a service-based economy. I've always said that, but it has worked up to this point. So I thought, I decided to Google each one of these words, each one of these metrics and the conference board. I got lucky, came up on this where it told me, wait a second, this was never in here prior to 2011. And it also told me that it was reformulated in the 1980s, 90s, and here in the 2011. So there you have it, folks. Anybody that wants to throw this argument about the leading economic index being down 19 months in a row and in, in terror, and in, in, at a level where we've never skirted or have not even, you know, uh, we've actually been in a recession before at these levels. Let them know this isn't as perfect as they think. All right, let's see what else. The, the conference board knows that the LEI is not a great tool either, which is why they also came up with a kind of the kissing cousin of the LEI, which is the CEI, the coincident economic index. Why do you need a coincident economic index if the LEI works so well? Right, the coincident economic index um, uses all the measures or metrics that the National Bureau of Economic Research uses, again, to label a recession or not. And as we can see, the CEI, which is the light shaded, is basically at all time highs. That takes personal income and expenditures, industrial production, um, non farm payrolls and retail trade. I mean, if you think about those four items, those are the four that continue to do well in the economy. But if you look at the LEI, you get a better perspective of, well, it's not really a good gauge of our economy. How predictive is the LEI when it comes to the S&P 500 if it's not even predictive of the future economic outcomes? Not very predictive at all. This chart here from Renaissance Macro Research, the S&P 500 index, six month forward returns based on what the LEI's year over year percent change is. Folks, it has a negative correlation coefficient, negative 6.1. In other words, it's a contrarian indicator. It's a contrarian indicator. Can you believe that? All right, so for those of you on... FinTwit or X as it's called now, and you get all this pushback about why you're so bullish and they're throwing all the LEI garbage at you. There you go. You got a bad LEI? Must be good for S&P 500. 
here we are, 2023, S&P 500 is up 20%. The LEI is at its lowest level of the year. History repeats. Again, what can we expect in 2024? What's it going to be? We're going up, we're going down, we're going sideways. We're going to make a new all-time high. I want to remind investors and traders that if you are leaning bearish into 2024, that seems to be quite a lean again. Because the probabilities are actually better than you might think. You're literally, or figuratively, you're betting on a fourth bear market happening in a six-year time period. Four bear markets, 2018 in the fourth quarter, 2020, COVID, 2022, and you think there's going to be one in 2024. That's four bear markets in a six-year time period. You know when the last time that has happened in the S&P 500's history? Never. Big goose egg. It's never happened before. You want the market to make history. Remember that. Your job as an investor is not to think about the possibilities because anything's possible. Like That doesn't help you as an investor. right? The S&P 500 could go up 300 points tomorrow. It can go down 300 points tomorrow. That's possible. What are the probabilities? That's where you need to be as an investor and trader, thinking about the probabilities. And the fact that this has never happened before, four bear markets in six years, has a very low probability of happening next year, obviously. This data right here from Todd Sohn. Duration and magnitude of major non-recession S&P 500 declines. 2022, we had a 25% bear market, peak to trough on a closing basis, All right? But then, you know, we rallied 25% from the October lows. At the 11th month, at the 11 month mark off of the October lows, the S&P 500 was up 24.7%. So what does the market do 11 months forward? Right. We had a non-recession bear market up 24.7% 11 months off the low. The next 11 month returns, average 13%, median 12.7% over the next 11 months. One time, one time did the market deliver a negative return the next 11 months. That was, excuse me, 1946. Before the S&P 500 was the S&P 500 in 1957. So what are the probabilities that the market is going to be higher over the next 11 months? Over 90%. 90% probability the market is going to be higher over the next 11 months. Keep that in mind, folks. Um, let's see what else we got here. Um, this was actually, uh, somebody had asked me, um, because you know of this kind of data, Right, this kind of data thinks you know eleven months. Well, the market should be positive. You give a positive annual return next next year. But Peru Sashina says the S and P five hundred always declines at least twenty percent during a recession. Worry not though, because this time will be different. Obviously, that's sarcasm. Gray shaded areas on chart denote recessions. So here's the thing. What if we do have a recession next year, right? Well, according to Peru, the market has always declined 20% during a recession. That's true. That's a fact. But here's the thing. Recessions don't always start at the beginning of the year. What if it starts at the end of one year and carries through the first half of another year? The reality is 1970, well, 1949, 1945, 1970, 1980, all recession years, all positive S&P 500 return years. Why? Peru says, well, during a recession, you drop 20%. Well, before 1945, the market had been in a protracted consolidation phase before 1949. The market went through a couple of years of contraction as well. 1970, from 1968, 
into 1970, the market basically went nowhere. In other words, it was consolidating for time and price. 1980, same thing. Prior to the 1980 recession, starting in 1978, the market did have a 20% correction over you know a good 16, 17 month period into 1980. But in 1980, the market was up 23, 24% or so. So when we look at the whole of the calendar year, even if we have a recession, it doesn't necessarily predict 100% that we are going to have negative returns. So two things can be right at the same time. We can have a recession, we can have positive returns, but we can also have a 20% decline. We just might not end the year there. Keep that in mind. All right, um, let's see what else we got here. Tell me again. Well, okay. So everybody's pissing and moaning. The market concentration, the Magnificent Seven is, you know, they say it's, you know, contributed to 100% of the S&P 500 gains this year, which is not true, by the way. 50% of stocks are actually um, contributing to the S&P 500 gains on a year-over-year basis. So half of the S&P 500 is contributing to the S&P 500's overall gains. In fact, 100 stocks are beating the S&P 500. 100. But their cap weighting is much lower than the Magnificent Seven. So their contribution isn't as great as the Magnificent Seven. Here's the funny thing, right? Last year. This side is last year, 2022. Now, this bottom line is the Magnificent Seven, or as it was called last year, Fan Mac, right? which had a much bigger decline than the equal weighted S&P 500 or the other 490 you know, so stocks, 494 stocks were doing much better than the Magnificent Seven or Fan Mag. Nobody cared, right? It's as if everybody thought, that's fine. That's okay. Screw those guys anyway. They've been the biggest for far too long. They deserve this. Nobody cried about last year's underperformance in FanMag. This year, because FanMag has had a fantastic run throughout the year, everybody's, oh, look at the concentration. Look at the spread between FanMag or the Magnificent Seven and the equal weight S&P 500. That's how it works, folks. People have these biases for one reason or another. And the main reason is probably because they didn't buy the Magnificent Seven dip last year. They missed the boat. At the end of the day, who cares? We're really up in arms about a foot race. Whether it's the top, whether it's the bottom 494 stocks or the Magnificent Seven, look at this, folks. They're basically over a two year time period ending up at the same place. Can we please stop the nonsense already? Ah, Let the market live. Why do you need to become a Phenom Group member, right? Uh, Well, you need to because we do a lot of good data dives, you know, a lot of really good research. One of the things we talked about last year was the Shemitah year. Have you never heard of Shemitah? Well, it's Hebrew for sabbatical. Okay, this is a real thing. They, it's, some people call it the seven-year itch. If you look at the dates for Shemitah years, it's every seven years. And wouldn't you know it, almost every seven years, something happens. And it affects the stock market. 1966, right? We were ending a nasty bear market. 1973, most of you are familiar with the nasty spike in inflation. 1987, I don't think I have to tell you, Black Monday. 1994, bear market in bonds, savings and loan crisis, uh, long-term capital management, Japan. 2001, middle year, tech bubble had already collapsed and 9-11. 2008, great financial crisis. 2015, China hard landing, double dip correction into 2016. 
2022? Well, that was the question mark we had going into 2022. Lo and behold, Russia invades Ukraine, inflation spike, the Shemitah year happened again on schedule. To my point, why do you need a Phenom Group subscription? These were the things that we talked about going into 2022 that we might need to be aware of. Economies, geopolit geopolitics, it's all cyclical, folks. Happened again, the Shemitah year. So what might happen here going into the end of the year? December starts tomorrow, as if I need to tell you that, right? Data from Bank of America Global Research from December into January for presidential cycle year three, we are still in a pre-election year or year three of a four-year presidential cycle. S&P 500 returns uh, going back to 1931 show that the first 10 days of December suck. <laughs> Look at that. Nothing. It's a snooze fest, folks. <laughs> Nothing. The last 10 days of December are much stronger with the S&P 500 up 83% of the time. That's your probability or positivity rate. The average return is 1.75%. You're going to want to remember this if things don't go your way and if you're bullish, uh, if things aren't necessarily turning out with continuation of this momentum in the upside. And you might want to formulate a game plan where you're buying the dip because the back half of December is typically very, very strong. Think about it. Santa Claus rally starts, I think it's the final three days of the trading year. Next year is an election year. Again, what are you expecting out of 2024? Next year is an actual election year, folks, presidential election year. Now, we have a new president in Joe Biden, right? This is his first term. He's classified as a new president. How does that factor into the probabilities of positive returns in an election year? Well, the last 10 election years under a new president, the S&P 500 has delivered a positive return all 10 times. What if, what if we take that criterion out, right? Let's take out the new president thing. And let's actually go you know, back further. Let's go all the way back to 1928. How many times has the S&P 500 delivered a positive return in an election year going back to 1928? All but four times. This one should be highlighted too. Um, but 1932, 1940, 2000, and 2008. Do you think that we're going to have a financial crisis next year? I don't. I think you can take this one off. And you're basically left with three different times the S&P 500 has declined in an election year. So 83% of election years have delivered a positive return. The VIX dropped to its lowest level of the year this week. Lowest level of the year this week. And people always say here all the time, oh, the VIX is cheap. I, I, can't, I should buy protection when it's cheap so that I have it when in case I need it. Bad idea, folks. Just because the VIX is low does not mean it's a much more favorable protection. It just doesn't. Typically, historically, a VIX below 13 on a daily closing basis, if you an annualize the S&P 500 returns for every day the VIX closes below 13, your returns are compounded at 47%. Now compare that when the VIX closes above 20. These are all the times that the VIX has closed above 20 going back to 2014 on a daily basis. And then you annualize the S&P 500 returns. The return is negative 36.74%. Just because the VIX is low does not mean, oh, the market is too complacent. We're about to go into a correction. No, folks, that is not historically the way it works. So with that being said, again, it's the holidays. Treat yourself to a Phenom Group subscription. Get our exclusive videos. This video will be free to the public, but get our exclusive videos on a weekly basis. 
and be able to access this data anytime from our weekend research reports and our third party research. With that, I hope everybody has a fantastic holiday season, great end of year market performance. Take care and we'll see you next time.